Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central and we got your news for the day. Now before we get started with the news, uh, just a heads up, on Friday we interviewed somebody who worked with Guns N' Roses, uh, not just Guns N' Roses but worked with pretty much every single band member except Steven Adler and they worked on Chinese Democracy Live Era as well as the re-recording of Appetite for Destruction and uh, that interview is going to come out on Wednesday but if you guys support us on Patreon you've already got access to the interview and it's going to be a really cool interview. There's going to be a lot of stories you guys have not heard before on there. Uh, so you guys can look forward to that. And I'm also going to be shooting a video that's going to come out probably tomorrow or Thursday about the true story behind Buckethead and Guns N' Roses. A lot of people have requested it. I finally got a chance to sit down and uh, do one about Buckethead, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So let's get started with this week's news. And be oh, one last thing I want to tell you guys. Go over to GNRcentral.com. I've started a newsletter that goes out once a week. So if you guys want to get the latest Guns N' Roses news and everything that's happening on my YouTube channel, you can get it delivered to your mailbox once a week. And I don't share your email address with anybody. I just send you the newsletter once a week, and you have all your GNR news you need to know right there. So thanks for thanks for checking that out, guys. Let's start with uh, this week's news. So Louder Sound published an article where they basically sent out a request to a bunch of rock stars, and they asked the rock stars which album did they lose their virginity to. So Corey Taylor slash Chris Jericho Duff and a bunch more replied to it. Now let's see what Slash had to say. He talked about it in his book, but he revealed that Fleetwood Mac's album Rumors was the one he lost his virginity to. He said, I nearly first had sex to Aerosmith's Rocks. I've been courting this girl for months, finally got into her apartment while her mom was away and she put it on. I played it over and over until she said, you might as well just go. Usually it's the girl's music that you end up having sex to, so it was probably something like Rumors, which was very popular with girls back then. I have to admit, I'm probably going to catch a lot of shit for saying this, but I never understood why people like Fleetwood Mac so much. It's just not a band that I enjoy very much, but let's see what Duff had to say for his. He said his was Ian Barry and the Blockheads hit me with your rhythm stick. Duff said, this is funny. I remember my first sex. The girl was older than me. I was just a punk rock kid. She loved the song Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick by Ian Dury. Yes, I know the title is really inappropriate. I didn't really know what I was doing, but she did because she was 18 and I was 14. I was like, whoa, I'm in another league and it's kind of weird. They also interviewed some other people like uh, Satchel from Steel Panther. So he said his first one was Bookends by Simon and Garfunkel. He said, I was pretty young when I had sex for the first time, dude. I'm pretty sure it was the song Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Robinson, I, ironically. I was having sex with a babysitter. I remember I got, uh, we had really good sex, and I had a friend there and double teamed the babysitter. It was pretty awesome. I remember this because the sex was really good. I was really good at sex. Some people are just born for sex. Plus, I was pretty well hung at a young age. So I don't know if that's actually him or his character speaking like that. They also interviewed uh, Nikki Six, who said his first one was Seals and Crofts, Summer Breeze. And they also interviewed Andrew W.K., who said his first record was the Moody Blues, uh, Days of the Future Past. And then uh, they also interviewed Chris Jericho and a bunch of other people. So I've linked to that down below if you guys want to go check that out. Let's go on to our next news story. So Guns N' Roses managers once again exchange words in the press. So Doug Goldstein, of course, came on our show. He talked a bit about the Steven Adler lawsuit. And, uh, you know, Alan Niven, who was Guns N' Roses manager uh, before Doug Goldstein, uh, responded and basically uh, refuted some of the allegations. He said, um, he said, he basically laid out a list of items that were wrong. So he said, number one, the case was not settled on the steps of the court. It was immediately, uh, se it was settled immediately before the jury retired after two weeks of hearings in front of the judge, referring to the Stephen Adler lawsuit. So Doug in our interview said that the uh, the lawsuit was settled at the steps of the court. So Niven said, number two, Adler's attorneys offered a settlement of $375,000 after approximately one week of the case being heard. They were concerned they were losing the case. Goldstein and Rose rejected the offer. Therefore, Goldstein and Rose took the stand. At the conclusion of the case, I had lunch with the entire jury. They informed me they thought Goldstein was a phony and were amused at the crocodile tears on the stand. They disliked Axel intensely, who seemed medicated and thus cold. These two shifted the case into Adler's favor. He said, number three, Goldstein was covered by a litigation insurance that also protected the band. I had put that in his place. I had put the I had put that in place. Him claiming of paying five hundred thousand dollars is false. And he went on to say, number four, subsequent to Rose and Goldstein's testimony in court and settlement, it became something in an order of two point seven five million dollars from the band and Goldstein. I was tapped for a relatively modest $175,000. If there was any crucifixion, it was of Rose and Goldstein. I further paid over $300,000 in legal fees out of my own pocket at the mercy of the actions of Rose and Goldstein. And finally, he said, number four or five, yes, indeed, that Stephen received composing royalties was something of a gift. The policy was that while one of the members of the band would benefit from all the monies being shared, one for all and all for one. If you left the band and were not a writer, then the privilege ended. 
This method was used by a lot of bands, the idea of being able to prevent arguments over money destroying band chemistry. Van Halen, for example, did the same. The Boomtown Rats famously lost the plot and fell apart because there was no composing sharing, and after the first publishing royalties arrived, everyone wanted to be a writer. Sometimes it's in everyone's best interest to share. No one enforced this on anyone in the band. It was accepted and understood well before Goldstein was employed as a tour manager. It was their decision, including Axel. I consider that the band bent and made a gift to Axel, and he received a larger share. If anyone actually deserved a larger share, it was Izzy. As regards hubris and greed, we looked no further than the fact that Axel cut Izzy and Stephen out of the recent tour and took the lion's share of the income. As regards Goldstein, Goldstein, Axel's boy, if his lips are moving and most likely he's lying, ask him for how he participated in the stealing of the name, the copyrights, and trademarks from the other band members. We all know who had their hand on the helm. To have betrayed by G Swine was bad enough. To have to hear or read him now is anathema. Regards, Alan Niven. So Slash has been giving a bunch of interviews because he's now on tour with Miles Kennedy and the Conspirators. And he gave an interview about his gym routine and how he basically stays in shape. He said he's tried to hit the gym at least every other day if I can. And I'm not that hardcore about it. I hate the gym, in fact. He told um, a um, lifestyle... Uh, it was like a lifestyle website in Singapore by email. He said, I do try to keep my stamina up for those two to three, four hour shows you do every night. You have to be prepared for that. He also gave a separate interview where he gave advice to aspiring musicians. It seems like every interview he does, he's always asked the same question over and over again. So turning now to some Axel news. So as you guys know, Gary Sunshine, who is Axel's guitar teacher, uh, gave an interview to Appetite for Distortion. He talked about which songs Axel used to practice uh, when he was learning guitar back in the 90s so he said he wanted to brush up on guitar and things like that there were no real intense there was no real intense plan involved it was just like i would come up to his house once a week for a few hours here and there and we would bounce ideas and work on things i remember my focus was i knew he was writing and he was in a period of what's next where everybody had their eyes on him i knew it was about writing and being creative in the whole in that whole world and that's what mattered to him not learning actual guitar things that may or may not be helpful so we went with the with that angle and we were working on everything from the beatles to radiohead just other concepts that were now blues related because they had exhausted the Aerosmith blues model somewhat. They did it to the max on the first record so he was trying to go in a different direction and I think he's a very creative guy. I remember doing certain Beatles songs and I remember Radiohead too because it was just interesting chord changes and ideas so it was mostly that. I was the kind of guitar instructor. I was kind of uh, his guitar instructor but it wasn't really that. I was uh, talking and hanging out a little bit and we did between six months and a year I'm not really sure. So he was being interviewed on a website in Singapore and he said another thing is when a record company, especially a major label, picks up a new artist, they don't develop them, he continued. They want to have a hit right there at the beginning, record it and put it out there and sell a gazillion copies. In the old days, you'd sign a band that had great potential. Sometimes it could be really successful. Sometimes it might be have a minor hit or really not achieve great success. But then you do another record and you just keep working it up until the band really succeeded and that's how you develop a band. It's different now. On the other hand, he said, with YouTube, SoundCloud, and other such platforms, the sky could be the limit. At this point in time, it's really how you use your imagination and just make it up along as you go and see what works best for you. So Slash gave an interview a while back to Mitch LaFon, and he revealed how there's some stuff of Keith Richards that he's just not really a big fan of, or Mick Taylor. So he was talking about playing guitar and about guitar techniques. So he uh, he was asked that first Aerosmith record was underrated, to which Slash said, I think it it is very underrated, but all things considered, in 1973, it didn't sound as good as the other records did. Sonically, I think it was why it didn't cross over. Anyways, I can't remember what the first riff I had him teach me was, referring to his guitar teacher, but I watched him do it. He put the record on and he had a guitar and he sat there and listened to it and figured out the notes. So I eventually left there with all respect due to Robert. So Robert was his guitar teacher. I learned a lot of cool things, some pick techniques just up and down picking and pentatonics so he was asked so I he basically said so I quit the lessons and just started learning I was learning you know a Keith and mixed stuff some of the open chord stuff I just didn't go all the way didn't go all the way down Keith's got a lot of open chord techniques which don't really interest me I know uh, a lot more of it now than I had known then but a lot of Mick Taylor's single note lead stuff can you hear me knocking that solo the guitar and I were inseparable I used to walk around with one of those tape decks like a like a Panasonic and some cassettes and it was just that and my guitar 
So this is a cool old school clip that I'm sure a lot of you guys haven't seen. I didn't see it till somebody sent it to me. So this is an old school clip of Richard Fortas and Frank Farrar when they used to play with Love Split Love and they performed live on Conan's show. So I knew these guys played together in the Psychedelic Furs, but this is from the 90s. I think it's like the mid 90s. And you can see how different Richard and Frank look uh, from, you know, 25 years ago. So I put the link to that down below if you guys want to go check it out. So that does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to hit the like button and be sure to subscribe and go check us out on gnrcentral.com and be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter and go support us on Patreon as well if you want to see us continue to make content just like this, thanks. Hey this is Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses and you're watching GNR Central, yeah!